I have the pleasure of introducing today um, our first speaker today, Porfirio Quintero Cadena. Porfirio did his undergraduate degree in the Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León in Monterrey, Mexico, after which he moved to Pasadena, California for graduate school at Caltech. He did his PhD in biology in Paul Sternberg's lab, where he studied the dynamics of transcription that he will be talking about today, as well as the dynamics of actomyosin flow in early C. elegance embryos. We just heard, I'm sorry, but he's not gonna be talking about anything about C. elegans for now. Um, he finished his PhD actually just a few months ago, and he's now working as a scientist in computational biology at FBL 59, where he's trying to figure out how to leverage RNA biology to develop therapeutics. Very exciting. So to take a break also, uh, to take a break from RNA polymerases, he's also fond of philosophical discussions and playing Nintendo Super Smash. So very well rounded for video. Uh, hope everybody's excited as I am for this talk and take it away. Thank you so much for the nice introduction, Melvin. And uh, thank to the organizers uh, for uh, uh, organizing this fantastic seminar series. Um, so here's the title of my talk. It's a little bit long, but I hope that it'll make uh, more sense uh, at the end. And uh, I want to start um, by the first portion of the title, which is RNA pool tool lane. Uh, so this is a diagram of the RNA polymers. Uh, in particular, this uh, represents the 3D structure of the hollow enzyme that has uh, 12 subunits. And then in the back, I am showing you the uh, what is known as the C-terminal domain of the main catalytic subunit, RPD1. And uh, one of the reasons this uh, domain is really interesting um, and a reason you may be familiar with is that this uh, domain is highly unstructured. And uh, what I mean by that is that the distribution of shapes that this domain can take is quite wide compared to this uh, enzyme, for example. So one reason this domain is really unstructured is that it is uh, very repetitive. Uh, in particular, it's made of uh, CTD repeats or what is known as CTD repeats, which is uh, segments of uh, seven amino acids that repeat over and over. And an additional interesting feature about this uh, domain is that the number of repeats or its length are correlated with genome size. So in this plot, I am showing you on the x-axis uh, gene density. So for example, humans are here with a very sparse genome, a very big genome uh, with a similar number of genes as uh, ski elegans, for example. Um, and then the y-axis is the number of disorder amino acids most of which uh, correspond to the CTD. So what you can see is that uh, there is a, a ne negative correlation between the number of disordered amino acids or CTD length and um, the size of the genome. So um, organisms with big genomes are here or sparse genomes are here and have uh, many disordered amin amino acids or a long CTD. Whereas uh, as you go down genome size, you start getting shorter and shorter CTDs. So here are flies, for example, and here's yeast. And uh, I've been using uh, yeast to do experiments to try to understand uh, this question. What is the role of CTD length in transcription? Uh, so one of the first experiments I did to get at this question um, was uh, simply to measure growth rate in uh, CTD truncation mutants. So under these conditions, the wild type, which has 26 uh, CTD repeats doubles roughly every 100 minutes. If you go from 26 to 14 repeats, it grows a little slower. If you go to 12, a little slower. And suddenly when you go to 10, uh, this uh, growth phenotype becomes dramatically stronger and um, becomes only stronger and stronger as you go from nine, 10 to nine and nine to eight. So what I would like to highlight here is that uh, there is a progressive increase in the magnitude of the growth phenotype as you go down CTD length. Okay, so that's an interesting observation. And uh, because uh, here I, I am mutating the polymers. One would speculate that the origin of this growth phenotype is related to transcription. Um, so to try to measure the dynamics of uh, this phenotype, I did uh, the following experiment. So here is a gene that I am showing in this cartoon called GAL10 uh, that is inducible by the sugar galactose. So in this diagram, I show a yeast cell that has a GAL10 gene, which is tagged with an RNA hairpin that can be bound by a protein called PP7. 
which is fused to GFP, such that when you have a transcription of GAL10, you can have binding of this fluorescent fusion protein and then see a dot, a fluorescence dot in the cell nucleus. And I am showing you, I'm going to show you an example of a movie uh, from cells that are carrying these constructs. So here's the cell, here's the cell nucleus, and then here's these um, bursts of transcription coming on and off. Um, so something that becomes evident from this uh, movie is that, uh, as you um, may know, transcription happens in bursts. That is to say, uh, first a few molecules of uh, mRNAs of GAL10 are produced, then nothing, then a few more are produced, then nothing, and so forth. Um, so this is another way to visualize those type of data. Now I'm showing you an interval of uh, about 40 minutes, and each row now is uh, a cell compressed to a single line. Uh, so you can see uh, that these bursts of transcription coming on and off again for the wild type. And uh, I recorded such movies for also 14 and 12 CTD repeat strains. So as you go down the CTD length, you can see that perhaps that these bursts become a little less bright and also a little less frequent. And a better way to look at this data is to plot the distribution, the whole distribution of uh, fluorescence in this case. So the x-axis is the fluorescence per burst and the y-axis is the cumulative distribution. And uh, the main point from this plot is that as you go down CTD length, you get smaller and smaller bursts. The other observation from this type of data is that uh, as you also, uh, as you go down uh, CTD lengths, you get uh, longer and longer time intervals between bursts. So the distribution of uh, interburst times for the wild type, for example, shown in dark blue here, uh, is shifted towards the right, meaning longer interburst times. So I, as I was doing these experiments, it became uh, more and more difficult to ignore this observation that the CTD uh, can face separate, like many other uh, disorder proteins. And in particular, the length of the CTD influences uh, the phase separation dynamics uh, of the protein. So in this example from Guan Montiga, uh, I am showing you um, droplets that form uh, by this protein called MET1. In particular, it's disorder domain, and it's fused to M-cherry. And when you have GFP in the same solution, you can see that uh, there's just red droplets that are formed by MET1, but the GFP is just uniformly distributed uh, such that you can't uh, see any GFP with these uh, illuminating conditions. However, if you attach a long CTD to GFP, in this case, a 52 repeat CTD, you can immediately see that they start, these proteins going into the droplets that are formed by MET1. And this uh, enrichment in the droplets is dependent on the length of the CTD. If you go to 26 repeats, which is the length of the yeast CTD, they are still enriched, although not as much as with 52. And then if you go to 10, you get uh, almost no enrichment, uh, no visible enrichment in this case. So that is quite an intriguing observation, uh, in particular because it resembles the transition that I showed you before from um, 12 to 10 CTD repeats, where you start seeing a very dramatic impact on growth rate. So the next question uh, I wanted to ask is, uh, is this observation, is the CTD, uh, CTD, CTD's ability to face the right functionally relevant for transcription? And to try to answer this question, I turned to a different protein that can face separate that is called FOS. And this is just a picture of a yeast cell that is forming uh, structures that look similar to the images that I just showed you. Um, and this uh, protein has been studied, which is the reason that I picked it, and uh, for its ability to face separate. So the question now becomes, uh, if I have a CTD strain that has a short CTD, grows slower, uh, transcribes less efficiently, if I fuse uh, this phase reparting protein FOS that is uh, different in sequence, but similar in chemical properties, in particular amino acid content and the property of DM disorder, can this rescue uh, the transcription phenotype and the growth phenotype that is caused by truncating the CTD? So here's uh, my favorite experiment again of uh, measuring growth rates. You have again the wild type that grows every, doubles every roughly 100 minutes. This growth rate uh, decreases to about 150 minutes uh, when you have only 10 CTD repeats. Uh, and when you fuse uh, FOS, this phase reparting protein, you suddenly get a rescue, a slight rescue of growth rate. As you go to nine repeats, this rescue becomes more evident. So here's the 
only nine CTD repeats strain, and this is uh, the same strain, but uh, with a FOS protein fused to the polymerase. And uh, the rescue becomes only more evident when you go to eight repeats. And perhaps uh, the most uh, compelling piece of evidence is that you can get strains that have seven and six CTD repeats with FOS, whereas uh, normally the minimum number required for viability in yeast is eight CTD repeats. Um, and uh, to confirm that this uh, rescue comes from a transcriptional rescue, I did this RNA-seq experiment where I add galactose to a strain that has the wild type number of CD repeats or 10 CD repeats and then do RNA sequencing. And galactose has actually a very strong transcriptional phenotype in yeast such that uh, over 1000 transcripts are differentially expressed when you add the sugar to the media. And uh, if you truncate to CD, 10 CD repeats, you get only a fraction of those uh, transcripts uh, differential expressed. And when you add FOS, you get a, almost a complete rescue of the number of transcripts that are differentially expressed. So that's, uh, those are interesting observations. So what I've told you so far is that the CTD length can modulate the size and frequency of transcription bursts. And also that uh, this role seems to be uh, supplemented by a phase surprising protein that is different in sequence, but similar in structural properties. So to try to put this uh, in a single picture, I turn to this uh, diagram, which is the way that I uh, think of uh, transcription in terms of uh, mechanism. Uh, so in this cartoon, I have uh, proteins that are generically called transcription factors that can come together to form a pre-initiation complex to which the polymers can bind and then be released by phosphorylation to transcribe the downstream gene. And then each of these reactions has uh, rates. And uh, the proposition that I made is that the CTD length, because it can uh, modulate burst size and frequency, uh, should also modulate these uh, two rates. Uh, so the reason why it makes sense that it modulates the binding to the PIC is uh, because each of the CTD repeats can um, bind uh, protein in the mediator complex. So it makes sense that the more you have, the easier it is to bind. And uh, the CTD also has to get phosphorylated before the polymerase can start transcribing. And each of the repeats has to be phosphorylated. So the more you have, also the slower that reaction should be. And so far, there is no place to incorporate the observation that phase separation seems to be functionally relevant for this mechanism. Uh, so to include that observation, I proposed that there exists uh, another state that can bind more than one polymerase at a time. And this state is shown in this cartoon here, where this uh, um, indirect interaction happens via CTD-CTD interactions. And this uh, would incorporate the observation that phase separation seems to be related to this mechanism, but uh, in particular, or specifically, the property of uh, self-interaction. That is to say that CTD molecules like to be with other CTD molecules. So because this is a concrete chemical reaction, it can be simulated. And this is an example of stochastic simulations. Uh, I won't go into the details of this, it's just to show you uh, how specific traces uh, look like. Um, but uh, I wanted to recapitulate two key observations uh, from um, the experiments that I just showed you. One is that uh, there is a progressive increase in the magnitude of severity of the phenotype as you go down CT length. The second is that uh, this uh, phenotype can be rescued by fusing a soft interacting protein. So when I did the simulations or when I aggregate simulations like the ones that I showed you before, uh, this is uh, one of the statistics that I uh, computed. So the x-axis is uh, now CT length, which for simplicity is a fraction between zero and one one being a really long CTD, zero being a really short CTD. And then on the y-axis is the number of cells uh, that respond to um, a stimulus in terms of transcription. Uh, so what you can see is that as you go down CTD lengths, you get a progressive increase in the magnitude of uh, severity of the phenotype. And also if I simulate uh, cells that have a fused uh, self-interacting protein, you get rescue uh, just by the ability of having self-interaction, which I can do uh, by fixing the parameter of self-interaction and letting everything else be dependent on CTD length. Um, so, so far it makes sense. And uh, one uh, motivating question for uh, this work was that CTD length seems to be correlated with uh, genome size. So uh, this is a particularly interesting observation for me. The x-axis is CTD length again, the y-axis is the fraction of uh, bursts that fail. That is to say, you can go from here to here. You can form a pre-initiation complex without ever binding a polymerase if you disassemble. And that would be a failed burst. And this uh, number of uh, failed bursts 
decreases very dramatically as uh, you increase the size of the CPV. So this uh, observation could explain why there is a correlation between CT length and gene density. And finally, one observation that I get from these simulations is that as you vary polymerase release rate, and uh, this uh, phi parameter here, and CTV length, you can, be, you can get very large increases in burst size, uh, which is evident from here because I have to plot this in log scale. And uh, what this uh, could suggest is that the CTV could be, or this mechanism for transcription is a natural seed for phase separation. Uh, so this provides a very logical and conceptual link between the canonical transcription paradigm or the cartoon mechanistic cartoon that I showed you before and the new observations uh, that transcription seems to happen in phase separated droplets. So I am not saying that this uh, mechanism explains what happens here, uh, but that uh, there is a logical connection between the way that we've been thinking about transcription for decades and the new observations uh, that seems to suggest there's something very novel about transcription. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and uh, take your questions if you have any. All right, thank you so much, Porfirio. That was pretty fantastic. Uh, you were right on time, so we appreciate that. So if you're, if this is the first time that you're joining us, let me just remind you that you can either ask a question to Porfirio by raising your hand, and then I can unmute you, and then you can ask the question directly, or you can go to the Q and A box and then type your question in the meantime. Um, so Porfirio, just while we wait on people to uh, finish typing their questions, let me ask you. So how much do you take into consideration for the post translational modifications of the CTD? I mean, one of the things that is really surprising is that you can just add this fuzz um, to the CTD truncated signal, and then just that is sufficient to recover your differentially expressed transcripts. And then, I mean, you don't, you don't have phosphorylation, you don't have any of this, and that was sufficient to recover what you would expect for the uh, galactose uh, activation. So, so that was very surprising too, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, something that is related to your comment is that uh, yeast seems to be a, sim a system that is simple enough to allow that to happen. Uh, the way that I'm thinking about this is oversimplifying how the CTD works. Uh, so I don't know, for example, if FOS can be phosphorylated. It is possible that there are proteins that can phosphorylate FOS and help release the polymerase. However, it, it's also possible that, that there aren't any, in which case only the CTD is getting phosphor, uh, phosphorylated. So uh, an interesting consequence of this uh, train of thought is that perhaps once you have FOS used to the polymerase, you get accumulation of the polymerase in the promoter which doesn't normally happen in yeast. So that would be an interesting experiment to do. Yeah. But I haven't thought uh, deeply about uh, this question. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. All right, so we have a couple of uh, raised, question, uh, raised hands. So I'm gonna give the voice to Akis Papantonis. So Akis, uh, whenever you're ready to talk, go ahead. Yeah, cool. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. Yeah. So this was, this was very nice, very interesting. Um, I, was a, I was sort of trying to ask what Melvin asked and then Taking it from there, so we know that FUS can be definitely phosphorylated, so we know that, but it's definitely not phosphorylated in the way and you know by the enzymes that allow transition into elongation that the um, the polymerase requires. So would you envisage uh, a scenario by which all you need is a high local concentration of polymerase to allow transcription to happen? And could it be that the selection of the locus that you have chose to image um, is, you know, special. It's, it's a very robustly transcribed gene um, and a very strong response. So if you just go to another setting, another gene, uh, would you expect to see different results? Because a problem uh, with, the, with the droplets is specificity, right? It's a very nice model, but then you need to find a way to explain specificity. Yeah, that's a really good point. And uh, I think I would like to first to clarify that I am not saying that phase separation is a phenomenon that is exploited generally in transcription. At least in yeast, the way that I think about it is that most genes uh, recruit at most a couple of polymerases. Uh, so in the simulation traces that I showed uh, at the beginning, for example, there's uh, just uh, a couple of polymers that are being recruited. Some are transcribing simultaneously and more than two are transcribing simultaneously a particular gene there is very few polymerases uh, recruited at, at the promoter. Uh, so 
What I was saying is that a uh, protein like FOS or the CTV, which can phase separate, uh, need the property of self-interaction in, in order to do that. And this uh, property to self-interact, which I am showing in this diagram as uh, this rate epsilon, just means that you have the ability to recruit more than one polymerase, not necessarily to form a droplet or having anything that looks like an increased local concentration of that polymerase. Uh, the way I think about this generally is that uh, this is what happens. You get one or a couple of polymerases, at least in yeast, uh, with the rate of uh, transcription that we observe. And I think this rescue that I saw is not particular to gal because when I do uh, RNA sequencing and I compare um, the differential expression upon galactose addition to the media, I see very similar, I see almost a complete rescue. Let me see if I have one of those plots here throughout the, the transcriptome. Okay, I guess this is the closest that I have, but uh, so this is a wild type. You get a lot of differential expression. Uh, when you truncate the CTD, you get little differential expression. When you fuse FOS back, to the polymers, uh, you get, again, a lot of differential expression. And I wish I had this plot here, but if you plot, plot a scatter plot of the coefficient of the differential expression per transcript that you get between wild type and the FOS fused strain, you will see almost a, a slope of one. So it's a very specific correlation transcription wide. Uh, so I think this is working uh, for similarly for most genes in yeast at least. That's very interesting, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Agis. Uh, we have plenty of questions, so we'll just, if we don't have time to get to you, please stay after the coffee chat for discussion. Uh, Porfirio, so Jennifer Giannini writes, this is super cool. Is the length of FOS you added constant or did it increase as you took away CTD repeats? Did you ever only have FOS with no CTD, for example? That's a really interesting question. Um... And I tried to have FOS with no CTD, but the yeast cells uh, die. So the reason the smallest number of CTD repeats that I have is uh, six is because that's the uh, minimum and that I saw that is required for viability. And those trends are really sick. They grow really slow. However, with eight re repeats, uh, the wild type is normally really sick. With FOS, it's much healthier. Um, so can you remind me of the first part of the question? Yeah, that if you started taking away more CTD repeats, did you also increase the, the amount of FOS that you link to the protein? Oh, that's right. Uh, the FOS uh, protein that I uh, fused to the CTD remains constant. However, it is quite long. It's uh, 200 amino acids. Of, uh, it's not the full FOS protein, just the disorder region that has been shown to pay separate. And something interesting that I didn't show here uh, that I did do is that the uh, I also fused the uh, mutant FOS uh, proteins that uh, are less able to um, self-interact. And I see a correlation between the ability to self-interact of each of those uh, FOS mutants and the rescue uh, conferred by fusing that uh, particular protein. So this is all published by the way. You can look at the paper uh, either on bio bioarchive or molecular cell. And uh, I have an experiment that is related to this question, which I think is really interesting. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we have time for just one more question. If you can ask it very shortly, uh, Matthew Levine, if you can uh, go ahead and um, ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Hi, uh, Hi yeah, related yeah. to uh, Aki's Papadoni's uh, question and uh, basically to the slide you're showing now. Uh, so that's what, uh, that's what I wanted to ask if uh, basically the set of genes you get to be differentially regulated are uh, the same uh, in your uh, fast uh, fusion than in the wild type, but you say probably so because you have a good correlation. Um, so the, set, the the question about uh, what was asking Ado uh, Akis is more about um, the specificity. Um, I mean, if you think about it, what drives the specificity of the promoter is probably not the recruitment of the polymerase itself, but the transcription factors bringing it to, into context. So 
uh, I'm not sure actually you would wait for a so specific pattern um, in your model. That means that uh, it's probably only uh, the pool of polymerases that are actually available in the environment that are being facilitated into uh, the phase separation will actually increase the transcription uh, burst uh, size and uh, frequency. Uh, yeah, perhaps the concentration of polymerases influences the transcription rates, although I don't think to a large extent because uh, uh, as far as I know, the uh, concentration of polymerase is not very limiting usually for a typical gene. So I think the question of uh, specificity uh, might be addressed just by thinking about the general mechanism. That is, if you have a, a congregation of polymerases uh, not in a promoter, then that, that is not transcribing or doing something that we care about for this purpose. So only when you have polymerases that bind a pre-initiation complex that can activate the polymerase to transcribe, then um, you need uh, specificity. And that uh, specificity might be confirmed uh, by the binding, but also functionally by the phosphorylation of proteins that are specific to the CTD. Uh, yeah. So I think the CTD, it is, it is relevant to have the CTD sequence uh, for a function. So I'm really saying that there are two separable functions of CTD length. Uh, one is confirmed mostly by the sequence, which is uh, partially binding to these uh, proteins in the pre-initiation complex, but also confirming the ability of uh, that uh, the whole enzyme to be uh, post-translationally modified to do whatever function it, it needs to do. And the other is uh, an ability that can be conferred that is not as specific and can be conferred by other proteins, in this case, FOS, and that is the ability to self-intract. And uh, that is, uh, can be thought of uh, as a mechanism of getting the best bang for your buck, because uh, you would assume that this assembling this complex complex is expensive. So, because uh, in large genomes, for example, you have to have, uh, or in any genome, you have to have uh, contacts between en enhancers and promoters, physical contacts that yeah. happen less frequently in large genomes. Uh, so, if uh, in human genomes, for example, this happens once every ten minutes then you wanna make sure that every time that it happens, you use it and you produce a transcript. In yeast, it may happen one every 10 seconds. So it's not as uh, uh, pressing to use this complex every time that it forms. So having a CTD or a protein that self interacts might help you increase that efficiency of using the assembly of this complex. Okay, yeah, yeah, I understand. What I was more talking about is the specificity between the but anyway. We need to cut it short. We need to give. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. If you want to continue, please stay after the coffee chat. Okay. I'm sure everybody will love to continue discussing about this. Porfirio, thank you so much for the fantastic talk.